uh, said, uh, I praise you. And uh, he was praising them uh, for being faithful to uh, what he had delivered to them as the Lord had uh, delivered uh, unto him. But here uh, in verse 3, after in verse 2, he said, I praise you. Then in verse 3, he says, but. And uh, in verse 17, he says, after he had said in verse 2, I praise you. In verse 2, he says, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. Uh, this somewhat reminds me uh, of uh, the letters in the book of Revelation to the seven churches uh, of Asia. Uh, each letter will begin with a commendation uh, by the Lord uh, as he says he knows the good things that they have done. Uh, but then uh, he'll say, you know, this is good. Uh, keep it up. Uh, but then he'll say, but uh, you're falling short uh, on this. And so this is uh, Paul's uh, uh, approach. So in, in praising them for uh, accepting what he had preached and, and taught to them, uh, nevertheless, uh, there is a felt need to mention some things, some areas uh, in which uh, they fell uh, short. And... In verse 3, he said, but, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, uh, on down through verse uh, 15, or, or through verse 16, you're going to find the word head used several times. But most of those times it's used in a little different sense than what it is used here in uh, verse 3. In other words, most of these verses are talking about in a church service the men and the women as to whether they have their head, their literal head, the head on their shoulders covered or uncovered or whether uh, this head is shaven uh, or whether it has long hair. And the word head is used over and over in those verses. Amen? You see that? But it's used in a little different sense in this verse where he begins to address these things about the head. And, and that is, uh, he starts off talking about the head by saying, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. I submit to you that this verse is the main theme of all that said in the following verses about the head covering or not covering the head, hair or no hair, those customs are not the main theme here. The main theme is this eternal principle that has uh, to do uh, with God's line of authority and submission to authority. <laughs> and so he states that right, right at the beginning. The head of every man uh, is Christ. And in an authoritative sense, the authority of Christ uh, to which every man is to submit. When it says the head of a woman is the man. It is talking about the man's authority uh, and the woman's submission uh, uh, to it. The same thing with the head of Christ uh, is uh, God. 
I want to uh, refer here, plan to do this later, but this is a good place, of what Paul said of the colossal Christ in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. First place. So this is what it's referring to with the word head uh, in uh, verse uh, uh, 3. But as relates to the customs and traditions of whether a man or woman should cover their head in a church service or have long hair, short hair, uh, 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 what, uh, whatever, uh, here the idea is the head in verse 3 is Paul said, but I would have you to know that which Paul would have them to know had to do with eternal principles concerning lines of authority and submission. It is the responsibility of leadership to, uh, such as the Apostle Paul and leaders in the church today to teach how to apply unchanging eternal principles to customs and traditions which may change and may vary from generation to generation, from country to country, from culture to culture, from race to race, may vary, customs may vary from institution to institution, but there are eternal principles that do not vary, that do not change. And God wants leadership to teach membership how to apply those eternal principles to our changing culture. Are you with me? Now, uh, this uh, eternal principle of uh, the woman being subject to the man. Is it eternal? Uh, well, uh, uh, in, uh, now we know there is a, a sense in which uh, uh, e eternity, uh, there is no, uh, no time. And yet if you're talking about from everlasting to everlasting, uh, 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 even as, uh, as we are, uh, uh, we are a part of, uh, of that. Uh, even so, a uh, time which has a begin has a beginning and an ending falls somewhere, uh, 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 you know, uh, in in a space uh, of that from everlasting uh, uh, to uh, everlasting. But if you're sp speaking in the context of uh, of, of time. And uh, uh, yet, in a sense of eternal principles, as far as in time, how far back can you go? The Garden of Eden, amen? So Genesis 3.16, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That was way before anybody had a custom as to whether you should wear something on your head or not in a church service. But this concerning he shall have the rule over thee, that's an eternal principle. And uh, uh, so uh, we see this in that that went all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So what was said here uh, in verse 3, that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God, uh, that's speaking of eternal principles which uh, 
will never change, will apply to every country, to every race, to every generation. But then he goes on to mention things that have to do with the culture, the Gentile culture, there in Corinth. And it seems likely uh, that even the worldly sinful culture, that there might have been, been a tendency to try to bring some of that uh, in, into the worship uh, of uh, the church. But there are some cultural things that will vary from country to country or generation to generation but the eternal principles remain the same. So verse 4 said, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, this honor his head. There in this Gentile city uh, of Corinth, for a man's head to be covered was a sign uh, of a subjection. And this, uh, now it's interesting that uh, uh, this uh, decision, okay, and God wanted man to be a, a reflection of his line of authority. He is the head of the woman. And Christ is the head of the man. And in, uh, uh, that headship was to be honored. And in that, that day, if uh, a man covered his head, it, instead of it being a, a symbol of uh, his authority, uh, as a head in an uh, authoritative sense, it was a sign that he was in subjection. Now, but the interesting thing about it, that, that's in that culture, in the Corinthian culture. But what about this? This decision of the apostle was in point blank hostility to the canon of the Jews. The canon of the Jews and the custom of the Jews was just the opposite. For they would not suffer a man to pray unless he was veiled for which they gave the reason, quote, in their canon, he should veil himself to show that he is ashamed before God and unworthy with open face to behold him. So here in the culture, the Gentile culture, uh, at, at, at Corinth, if a man covered his head in a church service, uh, uh, he dishonored his head. But according to the Jewish culture, if he, if he did not veil uh, 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 himself, well then that would be wrong. So the culture was different, but in each case, the intent was to show proper respect to God Almighty and to recognize God as being the head uh, and the authority and man subject to him. So in either case, they were honoring the eternal principle. Uh, are you with me? Are you following me here? There are eternal principles that leadership needs to teach people how to apply to varying cultures. The principles do not change, but the cultures may change. Now, for, let me give you a modern day uh, for instance. There, there are parts of the world in which the men wear robes. <coughs> Some of them may look almost like, like dresses. Especially in the African countries, some, some of them uh, uh, would uh, 
look like dresses. Well, guess what? I'm not going to wear one of those in the United States in the pulpit. Now, I believe there is an eternal principle that it is an abomination in the eyes of God for a man to intentionally try to appear feminine. And I believe that it is an eternal principle that it is an abomination in the eyes of God for a woman to intentionally try to appear masculine. And that that principle is the same in every generation, in every country, that the principle does not change. Amen. But from country to country, the custom may differ as to what's considered a, a, to appear masculine or feminine. An outfit that they'd wear in Africa, the men would wear that would look like a dress. In that culture, that appears masculine. But but for me, for me to do it here. So in in Corinth, if a man uh, covered his hair in worship, that was not good. But yet in Jerusalem, the the Jewish uh, canon. Uh, uh, would uh, uh, would say that it, it was just the opposite. But the eternal principle uh, stayed uh, the same. So some of these customs in Corinth that Paul mentions are not necessarily binding upon our customs and our culture but the eternal principle that's behind it, the verse that he starts off with, uh, in verse 3, the main theme that he states before he gets into uh, hair coverings, it applies to all time, uh, everywhere, and that is that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. In 1 Corinthians, again, uh, commenting on this uh, difference of a head covering for a man in, in worship, as it varied even in Paul's day, the complete opposite in Corinth uh, is, as it would have been in, in Jerusalem, Paul said, as we uh, preach to you in time past, uh, as I preach to you in time past, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 uh, through 23, Paul said, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain to mo the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under, under the law. To them that are without the law is without law. Being not without law to God but under the law of Christ that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak I became as weak that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Consider the question of, of circumcision uh, in uh, the early church. Some were preaching and teaching that was necessary for salvation. The first assembly in Acts 15 said, not so. But here Paul, most of his missionary work done, done in Gentile countries, and the first place he would go to uh, would be a, a Jewish synagogue. And he asked the young man by the name of Timothy to accompany him on those missionary journeys. And Timothy had not been circumcised. But Paul knew if he took 
Timothy with him, and they went inside of a Jewish synagogue and began to teach with authority, they wouldn't get very many words out of their mouth before they'd be kicked out. <laughs> so guess what? Timothy became circumcised, Paul becoming all things unto, uh, unto uh, all men. So uh, customs and traditions are not the same in every country, in every generation. But regardless to the, the uh, uh, and vice versa, a custom and tradition must, uh, must never be an excuse for not being faithful to God's eternal principles. Yes. So you see it, see there's uh, there, there's there's two sides of it. So I remember one year at Bible Training Institute, Ray Wynn was the superintendent, and his theme for that year was flexibility without compromise. Amen. Flexibility without compromise. I think of Acts 15, and I preached on some of this in this year's assembly, where the letters were sent out from that first assembly, talking about laying upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Well, for almost 50 years, what those words necessary things registered in my mind were things that were necessary for salvation. Well, that was part of it, but that was not all of it. There were some things that were necessary that were addressed in that, that assembly to avoid the church splitting right down the middle and having a Gentile church and a Jewish church. There were some things that were decided that were uh, uh, unnecessary to show mutual respect for varying customs and traditions. There were some things that were necessary to be said if the church was to be effective in carrying out the Great Commission to every part of the world. They said more than just abstain from fornication. Now certainly that would have to do with salvation. They said more than it's not necessary to be circumcised to be saved. And yes, those things are necessary. But they also talked about let the Jews continue to read from Moses in their synagogues on the seventh day. And I can mention some other things that had uh, to do with uh, uh, the, uh, the blood of animals and animals being a strangle. That I believe all in the world that had to do with was a mutual respect for varying customs and, uh, and, and traditions. And uh, instead of having uh, 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 to do as a requirement for salvation, that it was, some of that was just the opposite to recognize that some of these things were not necessary for salvation. Now what about that circumcision being one of them? They were not just listing one, two, and three. And on and on and on about necessary things. These things are necessary for salvation. They even listed more things that what they were saying, these things are not necessary for salvation. Check it out. Uh, Acts uh, uh, 15. So flexibility uh, without a compromise. Verse 5 said, but every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered, dishonor her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now for the sake of time, I'm going to read uh, from a commentator that I think sums up so much of this uh, 
real well uh, this uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11 verses uh, uh, 4 through 16 uh, concerning uh, the covering or not covering of the head and how this related to the men and the women. Adam Clark says concerning uh, beginning at verse 5 and the words, but every woman that prayeth and then, it, of course, it said, our prophesying. He said, whatever may be the meaning of praying and prophesying, in respect to the man, uh, they have precisely the same meaning in respect to the woman. Paul recognized that women do prophesy in the church. But he was saying, that if they do, that they're at, at Corinth, that they should not do that with their head uncovered. So that some women at least, as well as some men, might speak to others to edification and exhortation and comfort. That's what prophecy is. And this kind of prophesying or teaching was predicted by Joel, Joel 2 and 28, and referred to by Peter, uh, Acts uh, 2 and 17. And that prophecy said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Adam Clark goes on to say, And had there uh, not been such gifts bestowed on women, the prophecy could not have had its fulfillment. The only difference marked by the apostle was, the man had his head uncovered because he was the representative of Christ. The woman had hers covered because she was placed by the order of God in a state of subjection to the man. And because it was a custom, both among the Greeks and the Romans and among the Jews an express law that no woman should be seen abroad without a veil. This was and is a common custom through all the east, and none but public prostitutes go without veils. And if a woman should appear in public without a veil, she would dishonor her head, her husband. And she must appear like to those women who had their hair shorn off as a punishment of whoredom or adultery. Now this is even seen in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 5 verse 8 and Numbers chapter 5 verse 18 surrounding verses you can read it, that a woman suspected of adultery was ordered by the, Mo, by the law of Moses to be stripped of her veil. So in, in that day for her not to have her head covered it would send the message I am not subject to my husband. He is not my head. I do not belong exclusively to him. And if a jealous husband came to the priest, the priest would examine the case, and if the woman had slept with someone else, uh, then uh, they would strip her veil from her. You see, although customs may vary from country to country, from generation to generation, there are certain customs or violations of customs that will convey certain testimonies that at times may be in conflict with God's eternal principles. I can remember at least as far back as, as the seventh grade and I'm sure before then. In the early sixes, I'm sure in the late fifties and as far back probably as you can go in this country before then. 
If a woman walked down the street with a pair of pants on, I can't remember even at that age, you would hear the wolf whistles. And the customs and traditions uh, were, were such until in, in the custom and tradition of that day that conveyed a message that she was available. Now, the way, the way we dress, the way we uh, look, we must be conscientious as Christians that it does not convey a message that our mindset uh, uh, is, and our lifestyle is in conflict with eternal principles. Customs change. They vary from generation to generation, country to country, and so and so. But there are eternal principles which do not change. And we need to be careful that our observance or lack of observance of customs are not in violation of those eternal principles. Adam Clark goes on to say, as a woman who dresses loosely or uh, fantastically, even in the present day, is considered a disgrace to her husband because suspected to be not very sound in her morals. Albert Barnes says, it seems probable that some of the women who on pretense of being inspired had prayed or prophesied in the Corinthian church, had cast off their veils after the manner of the heathen priestesses. In the pagan temples there in Corinth, temples erected the false gods. So part of their pagan worship, there were even, uh, uh, there, there were even uh, pagan prostitutes. And to remove the veil or not cover the head, being a, a, a symbol that they were not, they, that they did not respect uh, their, their husbands. And also, in, in that day, a common a punishment uh, for adultery in some places was to shave the woman's head. And many prostitutes in that day would shave their head so that people would know that they were the prostitutes. Now, does that mean any and every woman that has ever shaved her head is a prostitute? No, customs and traditions may vary. For all I know, there may be some country of the world uh, where it may be common practice for a woman to shave her head. But regardless to the custom, regardless to the country, regardless to the tradition, it's still against God's eternal principles to be a prostitute or to dress or look in such a way that would convey the message that one is such. So while all of these customs and traditions in 1 Corinthians 11 may not apply to us, the main theme that it starts off with in verse 3, the word head is, is used in verse 3. This is really what all these verses are about. The head of every man is Christ, and the head of a woman is the man, and the head of Christ is uh, God. Verse 6, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. And I've explained that in the context of the customs of that day. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her uh, be uh, covered. Geneva Bible note says, and in like manner he concludes that women who show themselves in public and ecclesiastical assemblies without the sign and token of their subjection. That is to say, uncover, shame them, say. Verses 7 through 10. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, 
For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created uh, for the woman, but the woman for the man. You see, it's all going back to verse 3 about headship and authority and, and subjection. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head uh, because of the angels, to have power on her head. It's talking about the symbol of being under power or being under authority and being uh, subject to that authority. It said because of the angels. The fallen angels would not be in subjection to the authority of God Almighty. And that should serve as a reminder of those who will not respect God's lines of authority today. Verses 11 and 12. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God. So in the work of the Lord, the men cannot do that work without the women. And neither the women without the men. But it is God that worketh all in all, and to God be the glory. Amen. And again, Paul said of the colossal Christ in Colossians 1 and 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Verses 13 through 16. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. However, let me say this. But even if the church of God has no such custom, she still has the eternal principle of verse 2 that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So whether we're bound to the custom or not, we are still bound to God's eternal principles. Then in verse 17, now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. And then he goes into uh, questions about the Lord's Supper. But I read that to take you back where it said in verse 2, I praise you. But then verse 3 said, but... And then when he gets through discussing this concern of the head, he says in verse 17, I praise you not. And he's going into a second thing that he couldn't praise him for, which was concerning uh, the way they wrongfully observed the Lord's Supper. Some concluding remarks in the light of what we've shared to you from the words here today. Some of this be a little repetitious, but in summary, it is an abomination in the eyes of God for a man to intentionally try to look feminine or for a woman to intentionally try to look masculine. But customs may vary from generation to generation or even from country to country, from race to race, it is to what's considered to appear feminine or masculine. The way we dress or look can convey a message as to whether we have respect for God's 
the eternal principles. Not only respect for God, but respect for our spouses. A spouse who dresses, now a spouse can either be a, a, a man or, or a woman. Married to the opposite sex. <laughs> a spouse who dresses in a seductive, indecent manner shows disrespect to their companion and conveys a message that they are not exclusively subject to their companion. Now, I'm I know you people, you're not quiet because you disagree with me. So can I hear an amen? Amen. Here's another one. The Holy Ghost and a little common sense will help people know the difference in an apron and a fig leaf. <laughs> the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they realized they were naked and they made themselves aprons of fig leaves. But when God came and saw them, okay, I didn't say that just right, did I? The difference in an apron uh, and a fig leaf. Well, have you know the difference in an apron and a coat? They made themselves an apron of fig leaves. But when God saw them, he slew an animal, took the skin of that animal, and he made them a coat. So, you know, without the pastor going around with a measure tape in his hand, the Holy Ghost and a little common sense will help people know the difference in an apron and a coat. Amen. Amen. So, uh, I, I thank the Lord for, uh, I felt the anointing when I was studying for this message because I have to confess uh, that for many years uh, that I had so many questions in my mind about 1 Corinthians 11 and it taking up so many spaces Concerned whether you put something on your head or, or did not put it there. Uh, but I believe the Holy Ghost has helped me to clearly understand this. That customs and traditions uh, uh, may vary. But that leadership has a responsibility to teach others how to apply eternal principles to the customs of people where they are. And again, we should never use customs as an excuse for violating God's eternal principles. Amen. May God bless you all. And we're going to have a good time of, uh, of fellowship.